When the founding fathers draft the Constitution, it's actually a decidedly anti-democratic document. See, this is a country that was founded on racism. We have a system that is built on race. We have to come to terms that this country was indeed built on the back of slaves, period. America was not built on freedom. America was built on racism. And we've been taught this narrative of American exceptionalism that we're really indoctrinated in. Like, we, we believe that we're the greatest country uh, that the world has ever seen. Yeah, well, sadly, we've just started to prove that America is not exceptional. Soon, every child in America will enter adulthood believing these lies. Do you believe that America is exceptional? No, not really. They'll truly believe that America is bad, that it was built on racism, that our great nation, the one that liberated millions around the world, only exists because of white evil men who founded it. Lies like these are being forced into classrooms all across the nation and beyond. This is the 1619 Project. And lies like these, like the ones the 1619 Project continues to purport, are enough to destroy our nation. And America, we are quickly headed down that path. Tonight, I want to combat those lies with historic proof that you can hold in your hands. Tonight, debunking outrageous lies from the new Hulu series, 1619 Project. Hello, America, and uh, welcome to the program. Tonight, I hope your kids are watching, and uh, I hope this stays on YouTube. It'll always be found at blazetv.com, um, so you can watch it over and over again and make sure your kids and your grandkids and everybody's kids see the truth. What is the fastest way to destroy a people? Take their history from them. Keep them dumb, stupid, and not knowing where they came from. Once you lose the story of America, America no longer exists. No one fights because they don't know what they're fighting for. Nobody stands up because why would I? There is a miniseries that is on this week. Um, it is the 1619 Project. It's a documentary series on Hulu. Let me show you a clip from the trailer. Centuries in that spirit. The 1619 Project, it's not a history. It really is talking about America today. Yeah, the voice you hear is Nicole Hannah-Jones who created and drove this entire enterprise. Now it's funny that she says, this is not history because that's not what she said at the beginning of this project, what she said was, quote, the goal of the 1619 Project is to reframe American history by considering what it might mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year. Well, that, that's not our birth year. Doing so requires us to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story to tell ourselves about who we are as a country. Okay, well that's like reimagining that my birth date was 1812, which it clearly wasn't. But if you reimagine that I was born in 1812, my gosh, you can tell any kind of story. I could base my whole story on how the British were right to burn down the White House. Because I was there. I saw it. Are you out of your mind? This is not the way things work. One review of the new documentary series calls it, quote, a broad, admirable reframing of our history. Really? Reframing is a generous way to put it. It is actually really bad history. It is poison, as you will see tonight. But I'm not just gonna show you the poison. I'm gonna show you the cure with the actual documents, with the things that we have now collected over the last 20 years. We have one of the largest collections in our Mercury One library of Pilgrim history and uh, Jamestown history. In fact, we have one of the biggest collections outside of the Smithsonian. In fact, the Smithsonian wanted this collection that we now have, but the guy who owned it and spent his whole life collecting thought, hmm, I'm not sure that the Smithsonian is on the right side. So we have some of these artifacts tonight. History, even bad history, can be very profitable. 
There is now a best-selling book called The 1619 Project, a new origin story. There's a kid book with more in the works. Um, this is uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones at a racial healing town hall event just last week. If we acknowledge what this country was actually built upon, if we acknowledge that the reason black Americans live in the circumstances we do is not because of our pathology, but because of a country that was erected literally on um, extracting wealth from us, um, then we have to do something about it. Uh, the truth right. makes powerful people in this country very scared, and I'm glad that they're scared. The truth, the truth. This woman doesn't say, let's suppose, let's reimagine. She just said, when we recognize, well, let me recognize the author of all lies is Satan. And this is one tremendous lie. This country, as bad as it is, has been pretty damn good to Nicole Hannah-Jones. Last year alone, she raked in $1.2 million for giving speeches on college campuses about inequality and America's overall terribleness. Jones and her project have repackaged critical race theory. They are making an impact. Here's what she said about her goal for the project when it first came out. When my editor asked me, like, what's your ultimate goal for the project? My ultimate goal is that there will be uh, a reparations bill passed. Her plan is working. New York State Democrats are currently working on a reparations bill, and it won't come as a shock. San Francisco's Reparations Committee recently proposed a plan that would give black residents $5 million each. Holy cow. The trend is slowly gaining momentum. It will reach your state soon if it hasn't already. Probably the most disturbing aspect of the 1619 Project is the history curriculum that has been adopted by school districts in all 50 states. How are we allowing this to happen? Schools in Buffalo, New York, for example, uh, use the 1619 Project to teach high school students that racism is the reason the U.S. doesn't have universal health care. What? The Republicans use voter ID to target black Americans. This is being taught in school. Now, what a coincidence. Those are the Democratic Party talking points. Hmm. The 1619 curriculum also features activities teaching children how to rewrite history, like having them create, and I am quoting, erasure poems. As the curriculum explains, quote, erasure poems can be ways of reclaiming and reshaping historic documents. They can lay bare the real purpose of the document or transform it into something wholly new. Well, yes, if I erase the facts, I can come up with anything. Other activities include, quote, alternate timelines. I'm sorry, are we living in a Marvel world now? Alternate timelines, reevaluating U.S. history, mapping your community's connections to slavery, and my favorite, reframing history through creative writing. Dr. Peter Wood, who is the president of the National Association of Scholars, called the 1619 curriculum, quote, an effort to reshape everything that American school, school children learn about their country. You know, one could say at least they're learning something about America. The 1619 Project is propaganda. This is what Joseph Goebbels did in Germany. It is aimed at trapping an entire generation of students into perpetual victimhood. Now, why does this all matter? We have a problem in our country with suicide. A real problem. Suicide among African-American men is up over 30%. Our children. You, I know nobody's talking about this, but we should. Why are so many people killing themselves? Why is suicide rates gone through the roof? Because there is no meaning in our society anymore. Nothing means anything. It could be anything to anybody if they choose that that's their truth. There are no heroes. Tell me, who do you trust? What institution do you trust? What can you count on? 
I would say my family, but recently I have learned that evil is inside all of our homes and we have welcomed it through technology. Our kids don't know up from down. And so we're learning a new myth. Now truth is powerful, but mythology is powerful in the life of a nation. The story that a nation tells about itself acts like a rudder, steering the nation in certain directions for good or for evil. America has not been telling itself a positive story for a very long time. And believe me, I can tell you all kinds of really horrible things about America. We did a lot of bad crap. Our, our um, auction today, we, we just picked up a piece from George Patton that I couldn't believe it when I saw it. The guy was the biggest anti-Semite you've ever seen. It's horrific. I bought it today because we need to know the bad things of history as well as the good. That's the only way you know what the truth is. Now, the gatekeepers of U.S. history, our educators, especially at the college level, have been largely overrun with this philosophy of teaching history through a left-wing political lens. Let's reimagine it. Last year, the current president of the American Historical Association dared to question this philosophy, which he described as, quote, our increasing tendency to interpret the past through the lens of the present, end quote. In that column, he also dared criticize the 1619 Project. Well, that's a cardinal sin in his profession. He got tons of angry feedback and published a groveling apology for the damage and the harm that he has caused. Stand up, man, you know the truth. Is anything worth standing up for? What are you selling out for? Our true history is in trouble, the good and the bad. Let me give you a quote from George Orwell's 1984. He who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. That is just one of the party slogans in the novel. The main character, Winston, works for the Ministry of Truth, where his job is to edit history so that everything reflects the ideology of the party. During China's Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, the ruling Communist Party used their Red Guards to destroy what they called the Four Olds. Old things, old ideas, old customs, and old habits. Gang, we are in that period right now. Communist China literally became the history canceling party from Orwell's 1984. But we're the latest, and I can guarantee you we will be the best at it if we don't stand and learn the truth. The winds of our own cultural revolution are blowing. Why, by the way, would President Biden cancel the 1776 Commission, which was started to counter the false reimagining 1619 narrative on the very first day in office? Imagine that being one of your top priorities. It was a symbolic move to stand with the 1619 version of our history and unravel our nation. The fundamental lie of the 1619 Project is that America was founded on slavery. To be clear, America's founding was in 1776. But even if you played their little game and tried to make the case that America was founded prior to 1776, which I don't know how you do, there is a much more legitimate case for 1620 than 1619. Let me show you a map. This map was made by John F. Smith in 1888. You know why? Because America was, was getting ready to fight the Civil War in the 1850s, and we were having this same argument. We're Jamestown. No, we're not. We're Plymouth. We're Jamestown. We're Plymouth. We didn't know the answer because we didn't have the Pilgrim's Diaries. They had been taken by the British and found in the mid-1850s, returned to us a copy of it, and then we knew which one we were. So in 1888, published by Congress, is this map. It 
depicts two very different trees growing out of Jamestown. One of 1607 and Plymouth, founded in 1620. Now, he points out that Jamestown and Plymouth were founded on two very different ideological perspectives, which dramatically influenced the way we develop. Quote, the evil of Jamestown has always been and is at war today with the good of Plymouth. Instead of coming for religious freedom, the Jamestown colonists came as agents of the king for the purpose of economic profit and trade. Slavery was introduced early on in Jamestown and protected by their legal system, the British legal system, to enhance profitability. Well, you know what, gang, why don't we stop here and we don't have to reimagine. That sounds exactly like a public-private partnership. Learn from the past. Jamestown's relationship with the native tribes was much more contentious. Because of the lack of biblical structure and spiritual motivation, it created a very different society. That's what the map shows. It's the curse of slavery that comes from Jamestown. But if you look up, God's blessing of liberty, because Plymouth, on the other hand, came for primarily religious motivations, and they applied biblical principles much more seriously than Jamestown did. Jamestown led to legalized slavery. Plymouth led to the earliest known anti-slavery law in the colonies, perhaps in the world, of 1641. There's also a little thing called the Mayflower Compact, which the, prim uh, which the pilgrims adopted before they even came ashore on Plymouth. It contained the seeds of self-government and liberty that would grow into America's founding documents. Now, one of the major flaws of the 1619 Project is it totally ignores the anti-slavery heritage of Plymouth. Instead, it's just all about Jamestown, and that narrative is for the whole nation. Tonight... I want you and your family to see the actual proof that debunks several of the 1619 Project's ridiculous claims. I'm going to do it using artifacts from our American Journey collection. This is why I have worked so hard for the last 20 years to preserve artifacts. Not to prove my narrative about U.S. history, but to preserve the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the American story, and there's plenty of all of it. Good history works to depict the past as it was, even, even when, and especially when, it includes stuff that doesn't agree with your politics. So, let's start with some truth they forgot to mention about the origins of slavery. Next. Okay, in the same way that it matters how you vote, it matters how you spend your money when you're putting it out there in the economy. Every chance you get to buy American, and I mean real American, you need to. You should be doing a lot of it. This is all going to change. Ford is going to is going to massively change um, because the WEF has their new global rules in the European Union, uh, and that's going to affect our companies here. Uh, and we're all going to have to start living like Europeans. If you do business in Europe like Ford does, it's not an American car. Is that an American car? My wife saw a Jaguar the other day. She said, who makes that? And I said, Ford. Ford. I want to tell you about a company called Grip6. Grip6 is a small little company, and it's the true American experience. And it was started by a couple of guys who said, I, I, I think we really need to make our own stuff here. What can we make? Well, if you want to make clothing or anything else, it's damn near impossible. Well, they started making socks that supports American ranchers who raise specially bred sheep here in America that produce modern wool. Then the American manufacturers who wash the wool, process it, and then weave it into socks that keep your feet warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Now, I know it's a pair of socks. This is American business owned by Americans who have accepted the risk that comes along with only using American-made products and American labor. We gotta rescue our country and a really easy place to start 
is at grip6.com slash Beck. If you only learned your U.S. history from the 1619 Project, you would hate this country. You would. You'd get the impression that America, in America, practically uh, was just invented uh, on slavery. And we invented slavery in the slave trade. It was just us. The project's opening essay by Nicole Hannah-Jones declares, quote, at the time, one-fifth of the population within the 13 colonies struggled under a brutal system of slavery unlike anything that had existed in the world before. Wow. Now, in order to sell this narrative, the 1619 Project ignores the global context of slavery at the time. This should go, you know, without saying, except nothing goes without saying anymore. So I'll go ahead and say it. Slavery was and is evil. It is happening everywhere today. And yes, even in America. If you care about slavery, how about the ones that are captives today? What are you doing? It was extremely common all over the world, stretching back to ancient times. But that doesn't give America some sort of excuse. Any slavery that existed in America is tragic and horrible, period. But the idea that a brutal system of slavery was exclusive to America is absolutely ridiculous. And may I start here? This is just a couple of days, you know, before um, 1619. This document from our American Journey collection illustrates how common slavery was in the New World. It even dedicates, uh, it, 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 it is written decades prior to 1619. This is a Spanish royal decree from 1579, forcing Indian slaves in Peru to work in gold mines. I thought we invented it. Now again, this doesn't minimize the tragedy of black slavery in America, but the reality of the time is that slave ownership was not exclusively a white European thing either. An estimated 20 to 40% of American native cultures were enslaved before the first contact with Europeans. That puts them on par with the slave empires of ancient Greeks, Romans, and yes, even the Confederate South. Carter Woodson, this guy is absolutely an American hero. He is considered by many, like me, the father of black history. He studied the 1830 census data and found that among free blacks, they were free, who were eligible to own slaves, 16% owned black slaves. He found an even higher percentage in certain states. How about South Carolina? If you were a free black, 43% of them owned a black slave or slaves. South Carolina, 40%, Louisiana, 26% in Mississippi, 25% in Alabama, 20% in Georgia. I thought this was a white on black crime. This is a human malady. Again, not to minimize slavery, but to put it into context. I'm not reimagining anything. This is black and white proof. Now they show how diverse um, things were, even in America. It's not the sleek narrative of the 1619 Project. Bad guy, good guy. Mm. Another inconvenient context is that 1619 leaves out how common white slavery was throughout world history, including during American colonial times. Over 300,000 black slaves were shipped to North American colonies, but 1.25 uh, million white Europeans, wait, what was that? White Europeans were shipped into slave markets to Northern Africa. Did you even know that? This is an actual copy from 1682. This is the front page of the London Gazette newspaper. 1682. It shows and talks about a royal act to, to help prevent the abuse of white slavery. 
it illustrates that more than 60 years um, after 1619, the white European slave trade was still going strong. Again, it shows the central 1619 premise that brutal slavery was unique to blacks and all in America. It is completely dishonest. It is a lie. And you know who the father of lies is. The 1619 Project gets its name from the claim that 20 or so black slaves arrived in Jamestown in 1619. This marked what they claim is, quote, the beginning of American slavery. But they got the year totally wrong. This is going to blow your mind. They could have called it the 1526 Project because that's the earliest date that we know of that black slaves were brought to this continent by the Spanish to a colony somewhere along the Carolina coast. It was almost a century before Jamestown. Maybe the 1619 team didn't read Booker T. Washington's history on the subject. Yeah, he was black. He wrote, quote, the 20 Africans at Jamestown were not the first slaves to reach what is now the territory of the United States. And the overseas African slave trade had been in existence for a century before this time. According to the Spanish historian, uh, Negroes were part of the settlers of the Spanish colony of Chicora. That is the native name for the region. In 1526, on what is now the coast of South Carolina, and this, so far as we know, was the earliest appearance of the black man on the soil in the United States. By the way, not a single mention of Booker T. Washington in the 1619 Project. But if you know his amazing story, you know he's, um, uh, he's not really convenient for their narrative. The original Spanish colony did not survive. But another one a little later in St. Augustine, Florida, did. As early as 1565, the Spaniards imported black slaves. How do we know? This is in our collection. This is the official authorization from the Spanish governor in Cuba allowing a specific individual based in St. Augustine, Florida to officially engage in the slave trade that had already been operating there for decades. This document is from 1610. Again, demonstrating that slavery in what would become the United States was well established way before the supposed birth of American slavery, according to the 1619 Project. You know, the other major thing the 1619 Project leaves out, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite possible, uh, many historians uh, say quite likely, is that those first blacks to arrive in Jamestown were actually indentured servants, just like the white counterparts. At the end of an indentured servant, you, you were an indentured servant because you borrowed money from some rich guy and I'll work for you. Okay, I'm going over to America. Good, I'll come with you and I pay for my passage by working for seven years for you. The African servants would be freed just like the white indentured servants from England. Afterwards, many were given land in order to farm and become members of society. Remember the free blacks that owned black slaves? A man named Anthony Johnson is an example of this. It is possible that Johnson is one of the Africans that was brought to Jamestown in 1619. He was freed after his uh, term of service was up and he became a significant landowner. Eventually, Johnson, that guy, had several indentured servants of his own, including a black man named John Castor. Castor accused Johnson of holding him past his indentured term. So Johnson, one of the black guys that could have been on the ship from Jamestown, took Castor to court, claiming he didn't do his work, I own him for life. The court sided with Johnson. It is the first instance of, of a court in America supporting slavery other than a punishment for a crime.
Somehow the 1619 project failed to mention those little details, that the first blacks to land in Jamestown were likely indentured, and that the first legal decision for slavery in America was brought to court by a black man who wanted to own another black man. Doesn't take any imagination, just eyes to read. The 1619 Project claims that Jamestown is, quote, the country's very origin. No, that, that's a giant narrative leap, which the evidence does not support at all. Jamestown is definitely part of the American story, but it's not even close to being the whole story. Because 600 miles up the Atlantic coast was the 1620 part of the story, Plymouth. Now, why did they come? Well, they came because they could get slaves. No, this is why they came. This is extremely rare. It's one of the latest additions to our uh, American Journey collection. It is a tract from the 1619 called the Perth Assembly. This is actually, this was printed on a printing press in Holland where all the pilgrims were. And it was saying to the people in Perth, which I think is in Scotland, right? Uh, is it Scotland or, I don't know, part of that country over there with the king. Anyway, it said, don't, you don't have to listen to the king. What he's saying the Bible says to do, it, it doesn't say that in the Bible. This pissed the king off. King James ordered a manhunt for the pilgrim's leader, William Brewster. This is why they came. Huh. So it wasn't about slavery? No, it was about God. And then, let me show you this. This is part of a promotional tract from 1624 called The Good News from New England. It was written by Edward Winslow. He was one of the original leaders of the Plymouth Colony. It talks about the difficulties of life in Plymouth and the progress they had made, but it has zero mention of slavery or indentured servitude. You'd think, and by the way, you can own people and get rich might be in this, but it's not. There is no shortage of evidence that what you might have learned in grade school about the pilgrims was actually true if you're my age. They came to America for religious freedom for every man. Their corner of America was not founded on slavery. In fact, early on, the pilgrims made, what a, made it a capital crime for what they called man-stealing. What is man-stealing? You'll find that in the Bible. The Bible says, no slaves. Can't steal a man from his own land, take him to another and make him a slave. That was why they passed a law uh, in the 1640s. The slave trading ship went off course in 1646. It landed off the coast of uh, Plymouth. What did the pilgrims do? The pilgrims went and boarded the ship, found out that it was full of slaves. They arrested the captain and crew. The general court of Massachusetts decided we have to send these slaves back to Africa at the cost of the pilgrim community. This was the response to the arrival of a slave ship that is complete opposite of the Jamestown response. Have you ever heard that story? Gee, why not? Look it up. To believe that Jamestown in 1619 is the country's very origin requires you to be a moron. We're going to look at some more ignored history after the break. <laughs> By the way, if you'd like to help us preserve these documents, Please uh, uh, just go to mercuryone.org, um, look for our history preservation. This is also going to go on the road with me this summer. I'm going to take it to two cities in the Mountain West and hopefully to a city near you um, by the end of the year. Uh, we're going to try one and it will be on the week of 4th of July, the week preceding. I'll give you more details, but it will be in St. George, Utah. Now, the American Society of Healthcare Pharmacists, the group that tracks the production of medications all around the world, has declared, hey, there's a shortage of antibiotics, like really complex antibiotics, you know, cutting edge stuff like amoxicillin. 
she isn't that kind of critical? I mean, don't we treat all kinds of things like, you know, with that? I mean, I think I had that when, when I was, we're almost out of that? We have a supply problem with that? Yeah, yeah, because China. I don't really think we should be slaves to other nations. Um, and uh, your family should be prepared. That's why I want to tell you about Jace Medical. I found these guys, they make something called the Jace case. It is so your family can be prepared for the worse. It has five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, UTIs, respiratory infec infections, sinusitis, skin infections, and a whole lot more. Great way to be ready for shortages, and it's also really a great way to travel. Um, Darla wrote in and she said, my child developed an infection while we were on vacation. Luckily, we always travel with a Jace case. I started her on antibiotics. The infection cleared it up. Her doctor later told us it was likely that the antibiotics from the Jace case saved her life. I don't know. That's a pretty big deal. Go to jacemedical.com. Jacemedical.com. Use the offer code BEC10 at checkout. Save 10 bucks off your order. Jacemedical.com. Offer code BEC10. So I know you're gonna find this shocking, but the 1619 Project doesn't have a high view of our founding fathers. Beside making the bizarre claim that Americans fought the Revolutionary War to preserve slavery, they say, quote, neither Jefferson nor most of the founders intended to abolish slavery. Ugh. But then of course, they don't provide any substantial proof or evidence to support any kind of sweeping statement like that. The fact is, dozens of anti-slavery laws were passed in America's colonial legislatures that were vetoed or overturned by royal governors and judges who were appointed by the king. Even though Thomas Jefferson himself was a slave owner, he openly advocated for the end of slavery and referenced those American laws that were shut down by the king in this. This is a 1826 engraving of the Declaration of Independence. This is the original first draft. Mm -hmm. He talks about how these laws were usurped by a Christian king. Here to discuss this piece of evidence and more is the head of our education department at the American Journey Experience, Elijah O'Neill. Hello, Elijah. Glenn, thank you so much for having me. Why is this so important? It's so important because it allowed you to go into the mind of Jefferson while he was drafting the declaration with the Committee of Five. So not only is this Jefferson, but with Benjamin Franklin and John Adams as well. And as he's drafting it, you can clearly see that he meant for the abolition of slavery to be part of yes. the beginning of America. He even says in a w wild reference back to the beginning, all men are created equal. Oh, Thomas Jefferson, he didn't know all men included black people, really? Because in this section where he is the king is determined to keep an open market where men capitalized should be bought and sold. He meant that. Now, why isn't in the Declaration of Independence the final draft? Well, it's not in the Declaration because there were a few objections However, when the 1619 Project talks about those objections, they make you believe that it was the vast majority or all of the mistakes. Well, 13 colonies. How many That's colonies correct. were against stopping slavery? Two. Two. South Carolina and Georgia. That's it. That Even is Thomas it. Jefferson raised his hand for that clause to be in there. Correct. Huh. That's interesting. Seems like that's not the truth. Also worth noting that in 1807, the U.S. was the first nation in the world to ban the slave trade. Who signed that? Thomas Jefferson signed the law in. Yeah, but they weren't serious. They weren't serious. They didn't really stop it. They just stopped the slave trade. Well, and see what's ridiculous is in the 1619 Project, it also talks about how Thomas Jefferson wanted to remove that, but he was the president who actually signed the law to end the North Atlantic slave trade. So anywhere you can give credit to a founding father, they refuse to give any of it to them. Of course. Because not. they have to build the narrative that they didn't want a nation that would eventually free people like me. Another over the top claim 1619 project is that when it came to slavery and racism, quote, for the most part, black Americans fought back alone. Tell that to my great grandfather and my great great 
uncle who died in the Civil War. It is an absolute travesty. And one of the people I love to talk about love is him. Senator Charles Sumner. He was a senator from Massachusetts. And, and while he was giving his bleeding Kansas speech that lasted over five hours, he spoke out against some of the other senators that actually owned slaves. And after that speech, one of the nephews came from the House of Representatives, came to his desk in the U.S. Senate and proceeded to beat Charles Sumner almost to death. He ended up passing out and wasn't able to return to the United States Senate for four years. And the Democrats celebrated by making little chains that they all wore around their necks with a cane, basically saying, don't talk to us about slavery. Absolutely. Um, This is really important, too. Tell me what this is. And so what happened was, is during Reconstruction, you can see that Republicans were electing black legislators across the board. And what the Democrats were concerned of is that coming across the country. You can see the above is a photograph of the Alabama legislature of 1872 when the Republican Party was in power in Alabama. The Negroes in the above were members of the legislature. If you're willing to risk a Republican and Negro legislature in Alabama, like the legislature of 1872, vote for Herbert Hoover. But if you believe in white supremacy, vote the straight Democratic ticket on November 6th. What is amazing to me is um, things change. People change. I'm not responsible for what people did in the 1800s, so I can't lay claim to those great Republicans who I agreed with you know, they're not the same. It's not the same party, okay? It's not the same party, but it was Republicans that shut it down and actually mm-hmm. cared. It was the Democrats that were looking to enslave people, and I believe they they found a way right. to do that. People like right. uh, uh, Clarence Thomas are called a mm-hmm. sellout. Right. Really? You know who the sellout is? The ones that are doing bidding for the Democratic Party. They have just found another way to enslave the minds and the people of America. That's all that's happening Mm -hmm. here. And they're doing it with lies. Next, I want to look at some of the heroes that the 1619 Project chooses to leave out. Next. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, when is enough enough? If you're living with pain, often even every day, pain, moderate or even severe. Haven't you had about enough? I have tried a lot of different things and the only thing that worked were, you know, drugs from the doctor that would just zap you all day and I can't, I can't run my life like that. My wife forced me to try Relief Factor. I didn't think it would work because it's all natural and blah, blah, blah. I used to live in a ton of pain. I don't anymore. I got my life back. Please, please just listen to my wife. Try this for three weeks. If it doesn't work, great. But if it does work, then you need to take it. It's 1995. It's a trial pack. Thousands of people have ordered it. 70% of them go on to order more month after month. It's relieffactor.com. Call 800-4-RELIEF. 800-4-RELIEF. relieffactor.com. All Americans should be outraged that their history is being uh, erased. Mm -hmm. However, black Americans should be even more outraged because it's been erased long ago, beginning in the uh, early 1900s. Um, There are great black American patriots. The the Revolutionary War has three very important. It was started with a black. Its turning point was because of a black man, and it ended because of a black man. Do you even know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Elijah. Absolutely. So the first individual I'd like to talk about is Crispus Attucks. John Adams actually refers to the situation that happened on King Street, where we had the Boston Massacre. At the Boston Massacre, we believe that the first person to die was that gentleman, Crispus Attucks. He was a black man. And so here we have the beginning of the revolution, starting with the blood spilt of an African-American, right? And then going through that story and that narrative, we see throughout black Americans losing their life and giving of their own lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. So tell me about the black man that uh, 
uh, changed the course of the revolution. We were getting routed. Absolutely. So we have one, one of many individuals. We have Peter Salem. Peter Salem was known as the hero of Bunker Hill when he was fighting against Major Pitcairn. He was given orders to retreat from battle, and he said no. He grabbed a musket, loaded it, went towards the enemy, found the Major General, shot him point blank in the chest, and killed him. He actually died in his own son's arms. And they were routing us. They were heading towards us. That killing of that leader correct by peter salem yes it bought the revolutionary army enough time to retreat back to george washington regroup and save the continental army this is an extraordinarily rare um, signature of peter salem they don't exist these mm -hmm. african americans um, did amazing things one last story absolutely who ended who made it so we could end the Revolutionary War? James Armistead. He was actually the first double spy in America. He was under Marquis de Lafayette. He ended up going into the British camp uh, as uh, acting as a runaway slave from the north. He ended up be getting into good graces with the British commanders, and they began to have him in their planning meetings. And he was able to relay a lot of that information back to the colonial army so that they could evade every trap that the British had set for them. Now, at one point, he ended up telling the army that there was another embankment coming. The British started realizing, how is all of this information getting back to the colonials? And so they invited James Armistead into a meeting and they said, James, we know. We know that there is a spy in our camp and we don't know who it is, so we would <laughs> love if you would be a spy for us. Yeah. James Armistead, realizing that he was going to be a double spy working for the Americans, took up the offer, started feeding the British bad information so they couldn't catch our arm army anywhere, ended up finding out that there was an armada that was delivering supplies to Lord Cornwallis, fed that information back to the colonials, and essentially ended the war at Yorktown. She, so black guy, black guy, black guy. The entire arc is built by black pa patriots. You're welcome. When, uh, when we come back, if we have time, do we have time right now? Let me tell this real Absolutely. quick. Tell this story real quick. Wentworth Cheswell. So he was a, uh, an elected official for over 50 years in the state of New Hampshire throughout the 1700s and early 1800s. Specifically, the reason why this is important hmm. is because he was a justice of the peace over a predominantly white community, and he held the court of justice at his own home. Oh, gee, that's, huh, didn't read that in 1619. Back in a minute with an opportunity for you to experience our American journey this year. Great. You did a great Thank job. You. Great job. There are a couple of great opportunities coming up for families and students at the American Journey Museum here at my studios, Mercury Studios in Irving, Texas. There is the Family uh, American Journey Experience for Families, the seminar, March 24th through the 25th. Space is extremely limited. You can reserve your spot now at mercuryone.org. If you have a student between the ages of 18 and 25, there are two chances to attend our American Journey's 23 Summer Institute, one in June and one in July. You can learn more and apply at a AmericanJourney.org. Also, we are going to be in the American uh, West in July. Two opportunities. One will be to see the museum in your own town or near you at St. George, Utah. Then also uh, in uh, southern Idaho. We'll give you more details on that. That'll be in July. And then hopefully we'll go on the road all across the country. Good night.